Good evening. Thanks for coming. I'm Christian Wyman. It seems uh, not simply appropriate, but absolutely essential in an evening dedicated to poetry, upper and lowercase p, but mostly lowercase, actually, to open tonight's celebration with a poem. So this is from our Centennial Anthology, and it's by a poet named Brooklyn Copeland. Copeland is very young, and she lives in Indiana. That is all that I know about her, like so many of the poets that we publish. You know only their work. That's all you need to know about her. This poem is called Prayer's End, and the title hints at the knife edge of metaphor that the poem both creates and suffers, you might say, as end here refers both to the purpose or the means of prayer and to the point at which prayer ends or becomes completely useless. Prayer's End. Nature remains faithful by natural light only. Immeasurable, invisible in the wind. Visible when blades and branches bend. The wind speaks fluent rain. Despite it, the rain falls straight. And beyond it, Abandoned barns defend abandoned men. Abandoned barns defend abandoned men. Alert readers will hear Laureen Niedeker in the background of that poem. She too is in this anthology as we'll hear at the end of this evening. She too was plucked out of nowhere by Poetry Magazine at a time when her work and life really needed the boost. When Don Cher and I set out to make this anthology, we knew we need to mark a few of the highest moments of the magazine's history. W.H. Auden's Shield of Achilles, which in fact you'll hear in just a, just a couple of minutes. Proofrock, In a Station of the Metro, Sylvia Plath's Fever, 103. But we also knew that we needed to mark the magazine's history in another way. We needed to honor its record of discovering young and or neglected poets which meant making our way through all 40,000 of the poems published since 1912. It wasn't always fun, <laughs> to put it mildly. And some of our editorial meetings reminded me of nothing so much as the scorpion tournaments my brother and I used to stage in my West Texas childhood when we'd gather a couple of the meanest looking creatures in a jar and give it a good shake to bring on our own little apocalypse. I'm kidding, of course. Right, Don? <laughs> it is true that Don and I were dragged kicking and screaming into this project, but it is also true that it has proved to be one of the more rewarding experiences of my life. It was wonderful to work so closely with Don, first of all, who knows more about poetry than anyone I've ever met. But also all that reading helped us both to see the magazine as a whole, and to gain respect and even awe for all of the endless, anonymous editorial work that's kept it alive all these years. In a minute, we're going to hear some selections from the anthology. Because this is an evening devoted to poems, and because the poets reading tonight are all too accomplished to need introductions from me, and because you've got a program, I'm simply going to turn the stage over in a minute to our featured readers who have all been crucially important to Poetry Magazine over the years and during the last 10 years especially. You'll hear in this order Charles Wright, Thomas Sayers Ellis, Atsuro Riley, Frank Bedart, and then Don Cher. As Bernard said, unfortunately Mary couldn't come tonight and so Don and I are divvying up her duties, and I'll come back on stage after Atsuro, and we'll read Mary's poem and one other, and then Don will close the evening with a couple of poems of his choice. Before we begin all this, though, let's sit back and hear a voice from beyond. This is W.H. Auden reading The Shield of Achilles, which first appeared in Poetry Magazine in October 1952. Thank you. Right, this first poem, The Shield of the Kiddies, all you have to remember is that she means Thetis, 
and he uh, means Hephaestus. She looked over his shoulder for vines and olive trees, marble well-governed cities and ships upon untamed seas. But there on the shining metal his hands are put instead, an artificial wilderness and a sky like lead. A plain without a feature, bare and brown, no blade of grass, no sign of neighborhood, nothing to eat and nowhere to sit down. Yet, congregated on its blankness, stood an unintelligible multitude, a million eyes, a million boots in line, without expression, waiting for a sign. Out of the air, a voice without a face, proved by statistics that some cause was just, in tones as dry and level as the place. No one was cheered, and nothing was discussed. Column by column in a cloud of dust, they marched away, enduring a belief whose logic brought them somewhere else to grief. She looked over his shoulder for ritual pieties, white flower-garlanded heifers, libation and sacrifice, but there on the shining metal where the altar should have been, she saw by his flickering forgelight quite another scene. Barbed wire enclosed an arbitrary spot where bored officials lounged, one cracked a joke, and sentries sweated for the day was hot. A crowd of ordinary decent folk watched from without and neither moved nor spoke as three pale figures were led forth and bound to three posts driven upright in the ground. The mass and majesty of this world, all that carries weight and always weighs the same, lay in the hands of others. They were small and could not hope for help, and no help came. What their foes liked to do was done. Their shame was all the worst could wish. They lost their pride and died as men before their bodies died. She looked over his shoulder for athletes at their games. Men and women in a dance moving their sweet limbs quick, quick to music. But there on the shining shield, his hands had set no dancing floor, but a weed-choked field. A ragged urchin, aimless and alone, loitered about that vacancy. A bird flew up to safety from his well-aimed stone. That girls are raped, the two boys knife a third, were axioms to him, who had never heard of any world where promises were kept, or one could weep because another wept. The thin-lipped armorer, Hephaestus, hobbled away. Thetis, the shining breast, cried out in dismay at what the god had wrought to please her son, the strong, iron-hearted, man-slaying Achilles, who would not live long. There's nothing I like better than following W.H. Auden. <laughs> uh, but let's go back before that. Let's go back about a hundred and some odd years, say to 19, oh, my name's Charles Wright, by the way, 1910, eight, yeah, 1910 and 1911, when Ezra Pound had just gotten off the Metro at La Place de la Concorde and was greatly taken by the, uh, by the beautiful faces of the women and all the black clothing around him as he came out of the thing. And he's, he was very taken with that and he wanted to write a poem 
And he couldn't. He couldn't. He couldn't figure it out. He said it took him the longest time. And then, sometime later, he wrote a thirty-line poem about it, which he then destroyed. And then six months later, he wrote a fifteen-line poem. And then a year later, he cut it down to two lines. And he said, in a poem of this sort, one is time trying to record the pre precise instant when a thing outward, an objective, transforms itself into a thing inward and subjective. Uh, there you have imagism. And uh, this poem called In a Station of the Metro is one of the, uh, the core foundations of imagism, which was published in poetry in 1913. And if it took him that long to write it, then he probably wrote it sometime between 1910 and 1911. I thought he lived in England then, but it must have come over for, for the warders or something. You know? Anyhow, it's called in Ezra Pound, who uh, <laughs> not only was a staunch supporter of Poetry Magazine, but probably tried to take it over from Ms. Monroe. <laughs> Uh, as he did everything else, <laughs> he, got, he got his hands on. Um, in a station of the metro, it has strange spacings in the original version. The apparition of these faces in the crowd. Petals on a wet black bough. In subsequent editions of his poems, they've taken the spaces out which I assume he approved of, and it just reads as you would normally write it. The apparition of these faces in the crowd, petals on a wet black bough. And the rest is history, poetry-wise. Um, I'm gonna read three more poems. Um, the next two, are by a guy named Donald Justice and a guy named Charles Wright. Um, Donald Justice was my teacher at the University of Iowa. And in 1965, he wrote this poem called Minute 40, which, of course, that was the age he was when he wrote it. And he was so pleased with it, I remember him saying, I'm going to take this out to Verlin and show it to him, who was also 40. Verlin was R.V. Castle, who was a fiction writer. And he did, and I guess Verlin liked it, and I guess uh, Henry Rago at the time, the editor of poetry, liked it. I liked it, and so I think I'll read it tonight. Um, Don was a wonderful poet and a terrific teacher. Men at 40. Men at 40 learn to close softly the doors to rooms they will not be coming back to. At rest on a stair landing, they feel it moving beneath them now like the deck of a ship, though the swell is gentle. And deep in mirrors, they rediscover the face of the boy as he practices tying his father's tie there in secret. And the face of that father still warm with the mystery of lather. They are more fathers than sons themselves now. Something is filling them, something that is like the twilight sound of the crickets, immense, filling the woods at the foot of the slope behind their mortgaged houses. I bet they were tree frogs and not crickets, but I wasn't going to tell him. Um, the reason I'm reading these two poems together is they both revolve around the word something, which is a word I never thought Don would use because too imprecise, but he's made it very precise in that poem. My poem written in 2005, 40 years later, also revolves around the word something. Um, in quite a different way. Um, 
it was written in the wilds of northwest Montana, which is why the, uh, the, uh, the forest imagery comes into play. It's called Bedtime Story. The generator hums like a distant ding on zeek. It's early evening and time, like the dog it is, is hungry for food. And we'll be fed, don't doubt it, we'll be fed, my small one. The forest begins to gather, its silence is in. The meadow regroups and hunkers down for its cleft feet. Something is ringing the rag of sunlight inexorably out and hanging. Something is making the reeds bend and cover their heads. Something is licking the shadows up and stringing the blank spaces along, filling them in. Something is inching its way into our hearts, scratching its blue nails against the wall there. Should we let it in? Should we greet it as it deserves, hands on our ears, mouths open? Or should we bring it a chair to sit on and offer it meat? Should we turn on the radio? Should we clap our hands and dance the something dance, the welcoming something dance? I think we should, love. I think we should. And now this last poem is by our Lady of Transcendence, Sylvia Plath, called Fever 103, which is often on hallucinatory, as one would be in a fever, and a fever that's been going on for some days, three in this case. And uh, as it's back and forth, Fever 103. Pure? What does it mean? The tongues of hell are dull, dull as the triple tongues of dull, fat Cerebrus, who wheezes at the gate, incapable of licking cane, clean the agui tendon, the sin, the sin. The tender cries, the indelible smell of a snuffed candle, Love, love, the low smokes roll from me like Isidore's scarves. I'm in a fright, one scarf will catch an anchor in the wheel. Such yellow, sullen smokes make their own element. They will not rise, but trundle round the globe, choking the aged and the meek. The weak hothouse baby in its crib, the ghastly orchid hanging its hanging garden in the air. Devilish leopard. Radiation turned it white and killed it in an hour, greasing the bodies of adulterers like Hiroshima ash and eating in the sin, the sin. Darling, all night I've been flickering off on, off on the sheets grow heavy as a lecher's kiss. Three days, three nights, lemon water, chicken, water, water makes me wretch. I am too pure for you or anyone. Your body hurts me as the world hurts God. I am a lantern, my head a moon of Japanese paper, my gold-beaten skin infinitely delicate and infinitely expensive. Does not my heat astound you? And my light? All by myself I am a huge camellia glowing and coming and going flush on flush. I think I am going up. I think I may rise. The beads of hot metal fly, and I love, I am a pure acetylene virgin, attended by roses, by kisses, by cherubim, by whatever these pink things mean. Not you, nor him, nor him, nor him. Myself's dissolving old whore petticoats to paradise. Thank you very much.
It's an honor to be here. When I was younger, uh, Poetry Magazine was a magazine that was difficult to get into. You read it and prayed. This is James Brandon Lewis. I'm Thomas Sayers Ellis. I'm going to read you two poems, one by Leroy Jones, who now goes as Amir Baraka, published in December 1963, ironically the year of my birth, and one by me. Valerie as Dictator. Sad. And it comes tomorrow, again gray, the streaks of work shedding the stone of the pavement, dissolving with the idea of singular endeavor, herds, the herds of suffering intelligences bunched and out of hearing, though the day comes to us in waves, sun, air, the beat of the clock. Though I stare at the radical world, wishing it would stand still, tell me, tell me. And I gain at the telling of the lie and the waking against the heavy breathing of new light, dawn, shattering the naive cluck of feeling. What is tomorrow that it cannot come today? What is tomorrow that it cannot come today? What is tomorrow, tomorrow that it cannot come today? 100, what is tomorrow that it finally came today? or Oreo, or worse, or ordinary, or your choice of category, or color, or any color other than colored, or colored only, or of color, or other, or theory, or discourse, or oral territory, Oregon, or Georgia, or Florida, Zora, or opportunity, or born poor, or corporate, or more, or a noir, or fierce, or single, or diaspora, or a horrendous and tore up journey, or performance, or allegories, armor of ignorant comfort, or worship, or reform, or a sort chorus, or electoral corruption, or important ports of Yoruba, or worry, or neighbor, or fear of, of terror, or border, or all organized minorities, all organized minorities, or or organized, or or all or organized minorities. James Brandon Lewis. People who have no children can be hard, attain a male of ice and insolence, need not pause in the fire and in no sense hesitate in the hurricane to guard. And when wide world is bitten and bewarred, they perish purely, waving their spirits hence without a trace of grace or of offense to laugh or fail, diffident, wonder stirred. While through a throttling dark, we others hear the little lifting helplessness 
the queer whimper whine, whose unridiculous, lost softness softly makes a trap for us and makes a curse and makes a sugar of the malocclusions, the inconditions of love. Wasn't that great? Gwendolyn Brooks, amazing. There are um, a couple of more uh, of those Children of the Poor sonnets in the anthology, and I commend them to you. They're very beautiful, um, very strange, very um, juicy um, poems. And uh, she went on to publish a series of Children of the Poor sonnets, um, and so there are even more than the three that we have in the anthology. Hi, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. I'd be very happy to start off tonight, my little portion of tonight's festival, by talking a little bit about and reading from the infinitely refreshing, very, very distinctive poetry of Marie Ponceau. Uh, as many of you know, As many of you know, Marie Ponceau has been a beloved teacher here at the Poetry Center. And as some of you may know, she just a few weeks ago was awarded the Ruth Lilly Poetry Prize for Lifetime Achievement. Now this is a, an enormous, um, distinguished prize given by the Poetry Foundation and Poetry Magazine. And in fact, Poetry Magazine is going to be publishing in their next issue, the May issue, a folio of wonderful Marie Ponceau poems. So you should look for that. So as Bernard said, we're very honored and delighted to have Marie Ponceau with us tonight. So if she will allow it, I'd like to read her poem, Anti-Romantic, which is a wonderful poem, one of my favorites. It appears early in the, in the anthology. It appeared early in Marie Ponceau's career. It was published in Poetry Magazine in 1958. Anti-Romantic. I explain ontology, mathematics, theophily, symbolic and Aristotelian logic, says the tree. I demonstrate perspectives and proportions ways. I elucidate even grayness by my grays and grays and grays. Gravity's laws, the four dimensions, sapphic imagery come from contemplating me, says the tree. I perfectly exhibit the functions of earth and air. Look up, at, and through my branches, leaved, budded, or bare, laid in their luminous degrees against lustrous infinity. Your seeing relates you to all of space through me. Here's aesthetics, too, no sights nearer to perfectly fair. I am immediate and immediate says the tree. I am variable, exquisite, tough, even useful. I am subtle. All this is enough. I don't want to be a temple, says the tree. But if you don't behave, I will be. So this next poem um, calls forth a mourn howl in memory, a mourn howl across continents, as you'll see, in memory of Donatus Nuoga, who was a Nigerian scholar and critic. Um, the poem was written by Seamus Heaney on the occasion of Nuoga's death um, in 1995. Um, Seamus Heaney knew um, Nuoga at Queen's University in Belfast in the 1950s. Um, a few notes I would give you here. Um, this, uh, this poem is based on a tale, a tale from the Igbo people of Nigeria. Um, you'll probably be able to tell from the context of the poem, but Chukwu is a kind of supreme deity a first force symbolized by the sun. 
chi meaning a spiritual being and ukwu meaning great in size. So he's the big daddy. Um, Wicklow is the county um, in which Seamus Heaney was living in Ireland at the time. And this poem was published in 1995, the same year that Seamus Heaney was awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature. A dog was crying tonight in Wicklow also, in memory of Donatus Nuoga. When human beings found out about death, they sent the dog to Chukwu with a message. They wanted to be let back to the house of life. They didn't want to end up lost forever like burnt wood disappearing into smoke or ashes that get blown away to nothing. Instead, they saw their souls in a flock at twilight, cawing and headed back for the same old roosts and the same bright airs and wing stretchings each morning. Death would be like a night spent in the wood. At first light, they'd be back in the house of life. The dog was meant to tell all this to Chukwu. But death and human beings took second place when he trotted off the path and started barking at another dog in broad daylight, just barking back at him from the far bank of the river. And that is how the toad reached Chukwa first, the toad who'd overheard in the beginning what the dog was meant to tell. Human beings, he said, and here the toad was trusted absolutely, Human beings want death to last forever. Then Chukwa saw the people's souls in birds coming towards him like black spots off the sunset to a place where there would be neither roost nor trees nor any way back to the house of life. And his mind reddened and darkened all at once and nothing that the dog would tell him later could change that vision. Great chiefs and great loves in obliterated light, the toad in mud, the dog crying out all night behind the corpse house. And finally, a poem of my own. Um, this poem is called Hutch. Um, I think of it as a weave work, uh, weaving together of uh, herds and herd tales, um, things people said and go on saying everlastingly in the endlessly leafing, proliferating aftermath of a war. So it has a head note um, by way of what they say. The poem is trying to remember back to an earlier war um, and its reverberations back at home in South Carolina. But it was very much kindled into being by our most recent war sorrows. And it's called Hutch. From back when it was Nam time, I tell you what. Them days, men, boys, gone. Dark groves rose like Vietnam bamboo. Aftergrowth, something awful. Green have mercy souls here seen camouflage everlasting. Nary a one of the brung homes, brung home whole. Monks tar pines come upon this box thing worked from scrap wood. Puts me much myself in mind of a rabbit crouch. Is it more a meat safe? Set there, hid, bedded there, looking all the world like a coffin. Somebody cares to tend to it, like a spring gets tendered, clears the leaves. Whosoever built it set wire window screen down the sides. Long about five foot or thereabouts, close kin to a dog crate. A human would have to hunch. Closes over heavy, this hingy type lid on it like a casket. 
Swearing to Jesus, wasn't it I of pine laid down for the floor? Remembering the Garner twins, Carl and Charlie, come home mute. Cherry bombs, Fourth of July, them both belly scuttling under the house. Their crave of pent places, ditch pipes. Monks tar pines come upon this box thing, worked from scrap wood. From back when it was Nam time, I tell you what. Thank you. This is by Mary Carr, who I wish was here with us tonight. It was published in January 2004, and it's called Disgraceland. You have to imagine my voice a little twangier and me a little prettier <laughs> for it to come across. Before my first communion, I clung to doubt as Satan, spider-like, stalked the orb of dark surrounding Eden for a wormhole into paradise. God had formed me from gel in my mother's womb, injected by my dad's smart shoot. They swapped size until I came smaller than a bite of burger. Quietly I grew till my lungs were done. Then the Lord sailed a soul like a lit arrow to inhabit me. Maybe that piercing made me howl at birth, or the masked creatures whose scalpel cut a lightning bolt to free me. I was hoisted by the heels and swatted, fed and hauled around. Time-lapse photos show my fingers grow past crayon outlines. My feet come to fill spike heels. Eventually, I lurched out to kiss the wrong mouths, get stewed and sulk around. Christ always stood to one side with a glass of water. I swatted the sap away. When my thirst got great enough to ask, a clear stream welled up inside, some jade wave buoyed me forward, and I found myself upright in the instant, with a garden inside my own ribs a flourish. There the arbor leafs, the vines push out plump grapes. You are loved, someone said. Take that and eat it. <laughs> this is a poem by Craig Arnold, which we published in October of 2009. Craig Arnold was much beloved by uh, the poetry world at large, and in particular by the poetry community in New York City. A lot of people knew him here. I expect there are 50 people out in the audience who considered him a close friend. I considered him a close friend. He vanished uh, while hiking a volcano in Japan, and as many of you know, his body was never found. Before he vanished, he sent us this poem called Meditation on a Grapefruit, and uh, I, Don and I, came across the poem uh, the day before he vanished. I wrote him the next morning, we were both astounded by the poem, and I wrote the next morning to accept it, and Craig never saw that note. Uh, you can think of it in light of Mary Carr's poem, though I didn't intend this. Um, this is a poem of faith as well, a different kind of faith. I sometimes think there is no such thing as a faithless poet, unless they're a bad poet. <laughs> Meditation on a Grapefruit. To wake when all is possible before the agitations of the day have gripped you. 
to come to the kitchen and peel a little basketball for breakfast, to tear the husk like cotton padding, a cloud of oil misting out of its pinprick pores, clean and sharp as pepper, to ease each pale pink section out of its case so carefully, without breaking a single pearly cell, to slide each piece into a cold blue china bowl, the juice pooling until the whole fruit is divided from its skin, and only then to eat so sweet a discipline, precisely pointless, a devout involvement of the hands and senses, a pause, a little emptiness, each year harder to live within, each year harder to live without. Again last night I dreamed the dream called laundry. In it the sheets and towels of a life we were going to share, the milk stiff bibs, the shroud, each rag to be ever trampled or soiled, bled on or groped for blindly, came swooning out of an enormous willow hamper onto moon marbly boards. We had just met. I watched from outer darkness, I had dressed myself in clothes of a new fiber that never stains or wrinkles, never wears thin. The opera house sparkled with tears and tears of eyes, like mine enlarged by belladonna, trained inward. There I saw the cloud clot gust by gust form, and the lightning bite, and the roan mane unloosen. Fingers were running in panic over the flute's nine gates. Why did I flinch? I loved you. And in the downpour laughed to have us wrung white, gnarled together, one topmost mordant of wisteria, as the lean tree burst into grief. I'm going to read four poems. I'm Frank Bedart. I'm going to begin with the uh, poem in the anthology. Uh, it's from a long poem called The Third Hour of the Night. It's a poem about making. And this section is about whatever stops us, tries to get us not to make, stops that whatever within us recoils from visibility that tries to turn our tongue to stone. For many years, if I uh, enlarged the page, I could read it without glasses. That's no longer true. From the third hour of the night, Understand that it can drink till it is sick, but cannot drink till it is satisfied. It alone knows you. It does not wish you well. Understand that when your mother, in her only pregnancy, gave birth to twins, painfully stitched into the flesh, the bone of one child, was the impossible to remove cloak that confers invisibility. The cloak that maimed it gave it power. Painfully stitched into the flesh, the bone of the other child was the impossible to remove cloak that confers visibility. The cloak that maimed it gave it power. Envying the other 
Of course, each twin tried to punish and become the other. Understand that when the beast within you succeeds again in paralyzing into unending incompletion, whatever you again had the temerity to try to make, its triumph is made sweeter by confirmation of its rectitude. It knows that it alone knows you. It alone remembers your mother's mother's grasping, immigrant, bewildered, stroke-filled, slide to the grave you wiped from your adolescent American feet. Your hick, purer than thou, overreaching, veiling, mediocrity. Understand that you can delude others, but not what you more and more now call the beast within you. Understand the cloak that maimed each gave each power. Understand that there is a beast within you that can drink till it is sick, but cannot drink till it is satisfied. Understand that it will use the conventions of the visible world to turn your tongue to stone. It alone knows you it does not wish you well. These are instructions for the wrangler. And this is a short po prose passage by Fanny Howe. Uh, this amazing anthology put together by uh, uh, Chris Wyman and Don Scher uh, is punctuated by short prose pieces um, and this is one of them. Fanny Howe. To resist the reality of time is to resist leaving childhood behind. She called this resistance a flaw in herself. But is it? The self is not the soul. And it is the soul, coherence, that lives for nine years on earth in a potential state of liberty and harmony. Its openness to metamorphosis is usually sealed up during those early years until the self replaces the soul as the fist of survival. And now I'm gonna read a poem uh, that is very much about the fist of survival. Um, Christian Wyman, in his uh, really quite brilliant introduction, has this sentence. There is an animus, an élan vital, a force that moves through verse at the speed of God. And this is a poem that moves at the speed of God. It's by Laura Kaczynski. It's called Look. Look, I bear into this room a platter piled high with the rage my mother felt toward my father. Yes, it's diamonds now. <laughs> it's pearls. Public humiliation, an angry dime store clerk, a man passed out at the train station, a girl at the bookstore determined to read every fucking magazine on this shelf for free. They tell us that most of the billions of worlds beyond ours are simply desolate, oceanless forfeits in space. But logic tells us there must be operas. There have to be car accidents cloaked in that fog. Down here, God just spit on a rock and it became a geologist. God punched a hole in the drywall on earth and pulled out of that darkness another God. She just kept her thoughts to herself. She just followed him around the house, and every time he turned a light on, she turned it off. 
I wish I'd written that poem. <laughs> I'm going to end with a very great poem by Edward Arlington Robinson. Eros Tyrannos. It's one of the great uh, lyric poems of the century. And I had no idea it had been in Poetry Magazine originally. And uh, it was a great pleasure to f discover it there and discover a text that is just slightly different from the one uh, we grew up with. It's a poem about love, the tyrant, about a relationship, about what clearly becomes a marriage, uh, which is a disaster. Eros Tyrannos. She fears him and will always ask what fated her to choose him. She meets in his engaging mask all reasons to refuse him. But what she meets and what she fears are less than are the downward years drawn slowly to the foamless weirs of age. Were she to lose him between a blurred sagacity that once had power to sound him and love that will not let him be the seeker that she found him. Her pride oswages her almost, as if it alone were the cost. He sees that he will not be lost and waits and looks around him. A sense of ocean and old trees envelops and allures him. Tradition, touching all he sees, beguiles and reassures him. And all her doubts of what he says are dimmed by what she knows of days. To leave in prejudice delays and fades, and she secures him. The falling leaf inaugurates the reign of her confusion. The pounding wave reverberates the crash of her illusion. And home, where passion lived and died, becomes a place where she can hide, while all the town and harbor side vibrate with her seclusion. We tell you, tapping on our brows, the story as it should be, as if the story of a house were told or ever could be, will have no kindly veil between her visions and those we have seen, as if we guessed what hers have been or what they are or would be. Meanwhile, we do no harm, for they that with a God have striven not hearing much of what we say, take what the God has given. Though like waves breaking, it may be, or like a changed, familiar tree, or like a stairway to the sea, where down the blind are driven. Thank you. If it ain't a pleasure, it ain't a poem. William Carlos Williams said that. I first heard that when I was young. And like a number of us, I grew up with Poetry Magazine and have been fortunate up 
these past several years, be working there with Chris Wyman, but I hope that you've had a taste of what a pleasure all these poems and poets have been to us over the years, that we've worked together and tried to bring more of them to our readers. It's, it feels sad to conclude a chapter of Poetry Magazine's history with Chris Wyman leaving the editorship, but when I confided that feeling of sadness, which is the other side of pleasure, I suppose, a poet friend of mine said, and you know how hard we work to avoid cliches, he said, yeah, but when a door closes, another one opens. <laughs> so you never know. Speaking of being young and brought to poetry, when I was young, I was lucky enough to meet William Matthews. And for those of us who knew William Matthews, he was inimitable like the best poets are. It's tempting to try to imitate him, but I won't do that. But I will instead read his wonderful poem, Mingus at the Showplace, which is about being young. I was miserable, of course, for I was 17. And so I swung into action and wrote a poem, and it was miserable. <laughs> For that was how I thought poetry worked. You digested experience and shat literature. <laughs> it was 1960 at the showplace, long since defunct on West 4th Street, and I sat at the bar, casting beer money from a thin reel of ones, the kid in the city big ears like a puppy, and I knew Mingus was a genius. I knew two other things, but they were wrong as it happened. <laughs> so I made him look at the poem. There's a lot of that going around, he said. <laughs> and sweet baby Jesus, he was right. He laughed amiably. He didn't look as if he thought bad poems were dangerous the way some poets do. If they were baseball executives, they'd plot to destroy sandlots everywhere so that the game could be saved from children. Of course, later that night, he fired his pianist in mid-number and flurried him from the stand. We've suffered a diminuendo in personnel, he explained. And the band played on. Uh, something poets do, they're obliged to, but it's part of the pleasure of poetry, is to extend metaphors that we inherit. So extending Chris's metaphor of the scorpions, you might remember from the introduction, it was a little like that, but even scorpions, it occurs to me, experience joy <laughs> and pleasure. They must. Uh, and so really what you're seeing in this book and in the work that we did together is the result of that pleasure that we shared and hope to communicate uh, to our readers. But the Matthews poem gave us great joy, and so does the work of Lorreen Niedecker. These are from three poems she published together at one time in Poetry Magazine. One, river marsh drows, and in flood, moonlight gives sight of no land. They fish. A man takes his wife to town with his rowboat's ten horse, ships his voice to the herons. Sure, they drink full foamy folk till asleep. The place is asleep on one leg in the weeds. Two, prosperity is poverty. I've foreclosed. I own again these walls thin as the back of my writing tablet. And more, all who live here, card table to eat on, broken bed, Sacrifice for less than art. Three, now in one year, 
a book published, and plumbing took a lifetime to weep a deep trickle. We'll end tonight with a recording of Adrienne Rich. Uh, we recently lost Adrienne Rich, and this poem that you'll hear is called Final Notations, which is what we'll close with tonight. And it strikes me that the great thing, or one of the many great things about poetry, thank goodness, is that none of its notations are ever final. Thank you. It will not be simple. It will not be long. It will take little time. It will take all your thought. It will take all your heart. It will take all your breath. It will be short. It will not be simple. It will touch through your ribs. It will take all your heart. It will not be long. It will occupy your thought as a city is occupied, as a bed is occupied. It will take all your flesh. It will not be simple. You are coming into us who cannot withstand you. You are coming into us who never wanted to withstand you. You are taking parts of us into places never planned. You are going far away with pieces of our lives. It will be short. It will take all your breath. It will not be simple. It will become your will. <laughs>